It would be convenient to describe Death's Door merely as a combination of pre-existing features and mechanics. There is a long list of games that have contributed to the pantry from which this one selects its own ingredients. The coy, shortcut, heavy level design and death expectant checkpoints are reminiscent of Dark Souls, but the isometric view of a primarily two-dimensional combat space feels more like one of the supergiant games. The closest analog is probably Hob, which shares the restricted camera view, the lack of voice acting, the small world that feels big, the relatively simple combat system, and the rewards for exploration, like that thing where you find two or three or four shards to upgrade your health that's in everything from God of War to Hollow Knight. Death's Door, however, does not let itself be held back by the shoulders it stands on. In the end, there is nothing new under the sun, but this game is forging its own unique identity out of the action-adventure soup. A unified vision seems to have made tasteful decisions about what to keep and what to throw out. Incorporating systems that have things to offer, but without the contradictory elements that might accompany them in other games. This is what game direction means, keeping things in a unified space that ties everything back to itself. Despite thematic and environmental variety, everything exists on the same conceptual, visual, and physical bedrock. Except for the Hall of Doors, which sits atop empty space. This is where the protagonist's journey begins. He is dropped off late for work at the Reaping Commission headquarters by none other than Sharon, the bus driver, as you might expect. This is a dreary, colorless office consumed by the mundanity of processing countless departed souls. The privilege of colorful expression is reserved for a select few objects. A sword proclaiming its wielder to be the hero. A neon sign depicting a bowl of noodles. The red X of the metal detector futilely attempting to rouse the head of security from his television-induced reverie. The glowing end of Badger's cigarette. The blinding whiteness of our assigned soul door takes us to the real world, where colors are not restricted in this way. There is a little gate opening to make sure we're sitting comfortably, and then the first enemy to kill is also the first named boss. Nothing too crazy to start off with, just some spinny stuff and some highly telegraphed attacks to let us know what to expect from the rest of the game. The precedent set by this first encounter is never betrayed. Everything is just this, but more and different. Even the exploration in this tiny microcosm of a level lets you know what kind of design this game will have. Using the provided tools to open pathways, and, very importantly, shortcuts. After defeating this boss, the existence of an Act 2 is assured by a much larger, grayer crow who knocks the hero out and steals his assigned soul. The Grey Crow's portal leads to a bigger, open-ish world whose exploration will occupy us the remainder of this experience. We encounter some enemy variety, do a bit more exploration and puzzling, and fight the second boss before catching up with the Grey Crow at the summit. He throws our assigned soul at, well, death's door. The one door to rule them all, I suppose. And then tells us that more power is required. If you've played a video game before, you may be predicting that he will tell us to go to the three big areas on the map, fight the three corresponding bosses, and bring their souls back here to open the door. The tools we are given to do this with are a sword, which the hero somehow uses to perform light and heavy attacks with his apparently flightless wings, a very effective dodge that has lots of iframes, and a bow to start with. The bow, and the as yet unattained other tools, consume that white stuff below the health pips. You can get it back by hitting pots, boxes, mushrooms, enemies, or anything else that is meant to be hit. There is no jump, which makes the level design more tidy, and no sprint. 
exploration will be rewarded with better or perhaps just different weapons, of which there are a total of five, as well as those shards I mentioned earlier that are in every game. Here, you need four to get another pip of health or ranged attack juice. I think it's called magic, officially. Upgrades to melee damage, ranged damage, mobility, and charge attack speed are available in the Hall of Doors, and that is pretty much it as far as the player character is concerned. I like keeping this part of the game simple, especially when so much work has gone into the environments and enemies. In some games, it is up to the player to bring variety to each encounter, which the player never will. But this world's distinct biomes and extensive enemy variety ensure that just being a dude with a sword and a dodge will not get old. The cornerstone around which this world's variety is built is the cemetery which provides a stage for the exposition I have already described, and subsequently serves as a place of beginning for the journeys into each of three zones, or sets of zones. The three empty spaces beneath the bow on the UI are for the fire spell, the bomb spell, and the grappling hook. One of these can be found in each zone, and they are required to obtain access into the next, so the progression is guided by what tools you get and when, without being on rails. The three zones each consist of three levels that are different, but maintain the aesthetical and mechanical identity of the overall zone, just as the three zones are different but maintain the overall identity of the game. Gotta love fractal symmetry. First up is the Urn Witch's Mansion to the north, consisting of the gardens, the mansion itself, and the furnace slash laboratory in the cellars. The unifying identity here is one of pottery. There are pots outside and inside, pots on enemies' heads, pots that are enemies, and pots that explode. All of the normal, breakable pots will magically reassemble after a time. This provides limitless energy for your bow in the same way the regrowing mushrooms do, and also serves as a sort of metaphor for the ill-gotten immortality that is eventually revealed to be the whole reason for the pots in the first place. In addition to the pots everywhere, there is kind of a Victorian aesthetic that ties all three stages of this journey together. The garden is all lamp posts, hedges, marble, and wrought iron. Inside are gold-framed portraits of pot-headed loved ones, chandeliers, carpeted staircases, and fancy upholstery. The basement has more of a mad scientist or perhaps mad alchemist vibe with some industrialism mixed in, but its aesthetic themes are still from vaguely the same era with all this weird, science-y glassware that I'm sure has its own set of technical terminology. The fact that this place is lit by candles and powered by coal fits the theme pretty well, too. The Urn Witch's contribution to the game's enemy variety is represented by these rebar-reinforced oil blobs that are like the byproduct of heavy industry or something. The spinny pot dudes, and this big boy with the acid cannon, among others. Once again, they all fit not only the distinct theme of the area they are first found in, but also the mechanics of the game as a whole. Some of these enemies will appear elsewhere, and when that happens, you say, Oh, I remember those guys from the furnace level. And you also remember how to fight them. Speaking of the furnace level, it has got to be one of my favorites from this whole game. It is the first of these sort of final levels that are right before the area's boss, so the music picks up and everything gets more intense, and the level design here is fucking genius. You make your way through the facility, lighting these furnaces to start the machinery, which starts running to the beat of the music, by the way, and then you can access more of the level. There are shortcuts here, but you aren't just opening a gate. When you die, the run back to where you were is shorter because more of the machinery is running. My god, it's beautiful. For most of this game, shortcuts are rather common, and it is unusual to die without having made the next try much easier. I should probably explain how death works, because it is a constant companion on this journey. First of all, everything does one pip of damage. Laser to the face. Falling off a mountain. Getting bitten on the ass by a bat. All one pip. 
Taking hits and dying are both unmistakable oral experiences. A hit interrupts the music, only for it to spool back up a moment later. This is an inconvenience, a minor interruption to the dance that is this game's combat. It is as if, in the same moment the player slipped up their inputs, the pianist's hands slipped off the keys, and the music had to be hastily counted back in. You are also invulnerable for a short time after taking a hit, until the crow gets back up again, which is nice when you only have four or five pips to work with. Death is another matter entirely. The music immediately stops at the moment the final hit is taken, and when the word death is displayed on the screen, there is a blast of dissonant horns. I would almost describe it as anti-music, the antithesis to the vibrant, lively heroicism that so thoroughly permeates the soundscape when you are successful. Because my god, what a wonderful soundtrack. feels like the music is on your side, because it keeps building as you move through the level, and as long as you don't die, it will be right there with you. In a boss fight, you feel like a goddamn hero, because you're already on edge, afraid of failure, and this music comes in and makes it feel like the fucking last stand against the forces of darkness, and you know that if you can just stay alive, your private hero orchestra can just keep playing this absolute banger. They got piano. They got woodwinds, they got strings, sometimes with this really gentle but full pizzicato. The ambient Hall of Doors music features marimba of all things, and then pizzicato strings lead the way for the piano. Take a listen. All I'm saying is this sounds like it was a real labor of love for somebody, just like all of the beautiful art design in this game. But anyway, what a cool way to handle death from a sound design standpoint. You could put in a distinct sound effect for when you get hit, which does exist by the way, and all of the enemies with their different attacks also have different sound effects that, in some circumstances, you could probably time your dodges off of with your eyes closed. But if the music is going to be such a focus of the audio landscape the way it is here, interrupting it is like the most noticeable thing you could do. In a game like this, it is often difficult to tell when, where, and from what you are taking damage, and having such an immediate and unmistakable form of feedback is very helpful. Nothing is lost when you die. It changes nothing except the character's position in the world. After you die, you go back to the last door you touched. These doors are also the fast travel system, which consists of going back to the Hall of Doors and walking out of another door into a different part of the world. Genius. Typically, when you get to a new area, there will be a door waiting to be activated at the entrance, and that is where all of your shortcuts will branch out from. This here is a shortcut room in the second big zone, which is the forest and swamp area under the domain of the Frog King. The three levels here are the forest, where we are introduced to some different kinds of plant-based enemies, 
the mushroom dungeon, which is exactly what it sounds like, and the flooded swamp area. Again, these are unique settings, but all three exist under the same thematic umbrella. An ancient, forgotten city of stone that looks vaguely Central American in style has been buried beneath roots, soil, and swamp. But we are here to talk about shortcuts because this room has two of them. There is a cell containing a grunt who is locked up there because he no like Big Frog and is an individual. And then the way forward is through the spider web straight ahead. That is the only accessible path at the moment, but depending on which turns we take in our dungeon crawling, we will find our way back through one of these other holes. Opening the grates will make it so that when we die, we can skip a bunch of rooms and enemies and get right back to the place of current importance. People who play a lot of these types of games may be very accustomed to this sort of elegance. The shortcut stays open on death, so the old Dark Souls open this door but then keep going the other way thing is... A classic at this point. My brother was watching me play for this part though, and his mind was blown. The way these shortcuts twist your mental map of an area into a new shape always remains a unique feeling, and the first time anyone encounters this type of level design is always fun. While we are discussing environment design, I should probably explain how the healing works because it is environment based. There is no portable healing like you might find in a Dark Souls, so really, you're just trying to do things without taking more than three hits. Throughout the world, though, you will find seeds which can be planted in pots that exist in set locations. This will yield a plant which can be consumed once to return you to full health. If you die, the plant will bloom again, so if you make it back to the same spot and need healing again, it can be consumed once more. This is an unusual way of doing a healing system. In fact, I don't think I know of a similar system in any other game. It is one more way in which death is encouraged to be part of the experience. You go out, you find the seeds, you plant the plants, you open the shortcuts, you maybe earn enough souls to buy an upgrade from Darwin back at HQ. And when you die, you've made it a lot easier to get back to where you were and keep going. This healing system can be a bit frustrating in high endurance boss fights because you aren't traversing an area and discovering places to heal, but the game is balanced around it and the bosses usually have their own door or a restart immediately option so you can really just laser focus on learning each boss fight and figuring out how to do it without taking four hits. Traversing environments is generally a longer haul and these plants provide much needed pit stops along the way. If there is one zone that is different from the other two, it is this final, mountainous, icy one. The first level is actually the Stranded Sailor area, which has some enemies and the scavenger hunt for the best weapon in the game, but really serves as an area for friendly character interaction. The music here has a slower and jazzier tempo than the rest of the game, making this an emotional respite from the hardships of a journey packed with enemies as driven as the music that accompanies them. We are starting to see the regrowing ice crystals that will be used in place of mushrooms or pots, as well as the flags and round paper things hanging around that give this place sort of a Himalayan vibe. Castle Lockstone is less defined by the area's boss than the other two dungeons are, as it serves more as a lore dump for the Lord of Doors and ultimately the final boss. The most memorable new enemy introduced here is this Himalayan Spearman who is irretrievably cool. His attack patterns are so measured and purposeful. After a brief interlude at the camp of the Free Crows, we will encounter many more of these spearmen as we traverse the old watchtowers. The architectural style here completes the theme of an icy mountain range somewhere east of Europe. The castle and the watchtowers are both rather significant by comparison with the levels from the other areas. 
This is unmistakably the final zone, and it is built atop the other two conceptually and mechanically. Slippery ice and deadly lasers are the signature environmental touches here, and both are good examples of the complex systems of simple components that characterize most of the combat in Death's Door. The player character is simple by himself. He has light attacks, heavy attacks, dodges, and also the dodge into a heavy attack, which is a useful gap closer. I did not find much use for charged up heavy attacks or ranged attacks in moment to moment combat because they require standing still, which is generally a bad idea. The tool most commonly used under time pressure is the grappling hook, which actually has no charge time. Incidentally, I love that this game only has four of these tools, one for each button on the D-pad. Platformers like Psychonauts or A Hat in Time are longer games than this, so maybe they need more systems, but my least favorite part of those games is choosing which of my 20 tools to have on my controller's buttons, because the goddamn controller doesn't have enough buttons for this shit. You end up standing in front of a mechanic you half remember from three levels ago, hunting through menus to find the tool you're supposed to use. In Death's Door, everything you need to engage with the world is already on the UI. You could beat this game without pressing the start button, you would just be stuck with the starting sword for a weapon, and that should show how beautifully simple the design is. Enemies are also simple, and a lot of them only do one thing. The grunts jump at you. The fire plants shoot fireballs at you, which can be deflected, unlike the archer's arrows. The purple witches appear somewhere, cast their one projectile, and then disappear again, unless you interrupt them. These headless roly-polies just roll in your general direction, and are vulnerable after they run into something. The bigger enemies with two, three, or four attacks are usually introduced by themselves as a mini-boss, so you can learn their attack patterns before they are thrown into the mix. Take for example the boomerang monkey introduced in the Frog King's swamp. He jumps up in the air and will try to land on you, or alternatively tries to throw his boomerang. While he is on the ground, and not starting up his boomerang animation, it is safe to walk up and whack him a few times. Simple elements like these, along with the ice, the lasers, and others, synthesize into a complex system. A complex system is greater than the sum of its parts because its components are able to interact in myriad, unpredictable ways. The player character's abilities and the roster of enemies in any given room remain constant, but the complexities of their interactions often lead to different outcomes. Projectiles are deflected back to the enemy that fired them, or perhaps to a different one. Intentionally or not, certain enemies will be killed first, changing the threat composition. The player is acutely aware of all this because each constituent simple system has been introduced independently. You know to keep moving so the archers don't get you, unless you go out of your way to kill the archers first. You know which projectiles can be deflected, and which ones have active homing. This laser is following the player character, but it will damage enemies as well. Its existence fundamentally changes an encounter full of already familiar enemies, adding a whole new set of options and limitations for the player to consider. I chose to be conservative and fight all of the enemies under the shelter of this rock, but these complex interactions allow a variety of potential approaches and outcomes. The situation the player finds themselves in here is actually similar to the goal of modern combined arms warfare. The more things your enemy has to worry about, the more likely they are to let something through their defenses. Small arms, artillery, air support, and armor are all simple things to deal with by themselves. More than one of these threat factors existing simultaneously will begin to put more strain on leadership and unit cohesion. You are going to fight less effectively against advancing infantry if you are also under artillery bombardment. And if you have to worry about having anti-tank weapons ready at the same time, it gets even worse. This is why modern militaries have extended combined arms tactics even down to the squad level. Grenades, dedicated marksmen, and suppressive fire from a squad machine gun are all ways to try to gain a threat vector advantage. 
Being put into a situation like this as a player is a harrowing experience that requires flexible, moment-to-moment -moment thinking. This makes for very engaging and diverse gameplay where success feels like a true accomplishment of wits and skill. Many games strive for this, but it is often attempted through specific encounter design and enemy placement, which can obviate the need for enemy variety, or through designing complicated enemies or sequences that feel diverse, but are, in fact, only linear. Death's Door, however, starts with a set of very simple, robust systems. This enables the level design to be very creative, mixing and matching everything and letting the interactions just go. The player is swimming through a pyramid of emergent structures made possible by the solidity and versatility of the underlying mechanics and systems. Other games do have more developed versions of this. The physical sandbox of Halo or Splitgate and the AI sandbox of Dishonored or Metro Exodus exemplify the sort of interactions that are free to create emergent complexity. In Death's Door, though, the elegantly simplistic tailoring of each constituent system makes this phenomenon more visible and beautiful than ever. The bosses are, by necessity, less simple because one enemy has to occupy the full attention of the player. Even here, though, there are often additional elements added later in the fight once the player has mastered the boss's basic attack patterns. The player knows when this will happen because of the diegetic indication of remaining health. All enemies that don't die in one hit, but most noticeably bosses, will have glowing fractures gradually propagate across their character model. This is a welcome alternative to an overlaid health bar. Looking more closely at the art is encouraged when the art itself contains crucial information. Monster Hunter and its struggling competitor Dauntless have a similar system, but it is less visible, and the monsters take longer to kill, so it is a less useful feature. Here, the fights are short enough and the variation in the effect is significant enough that it does help the player determine how deep into the fight they are. This is a useful feature when bosses commonly introduce new mechanics when the damage they've taken begins to anger them. Sometimes these elements are drawn from the boss's own area, such as here, where we already know what each pot the grandma throws will do because we encountered both types in her mansion. By having multiple, independently simple threats to consider, the bosses also feel similar to the rest of the combat. They thus weave themselves mechanically and thematically into the fabric of the game. It would be bad if they didn't, because there are a lot of bosses. There are many bosses, like this spinny pot boy who is bigger than all the other spinny pot boys, and these motherfuckers who are very aggressive about teaching you to dodge. There are challenge rooms all over the place that are like boss fights but with multiple ways of enemies, culminating in the avarice challenge rooms, which are how you unlock each of the three tools. There are four silent servants guarding an upgrade for each tool, including the bow. These guys are all relatively similar and as their fights progress they add more projectiles to reduce the player's ability to feel safe anywhere on the relatively small platform provided. Finally, there are eight of the big named story bosses. Two introductory bosses and two conclusive ones bookend the three that are fought after exploring their respective zones, and the eighth boss we will get to in the post-game. All of these have an intro cutscene with their name that plays only once, preserving its importance. The Frog King's One is a work of art. All of these characterizations are so memorably unique, and so are the mechanics. The forest spirit is simple but memorable for having paved the way for what is to follow. The guardian of the door is a literal walking castle that shoots lasers. The witch and the frog king both make use of mechanics introduced in their areas, but are actually both pretty relaxed fights. I damn near fell asleep, deferentially waiting my turn while fighting the king of the swamp, but that means that Betty could not be more memorably different. Betty the Yeti the wonderful catastrophe. I think they had fun designing this game.
There is no waiting your turn in this fight. She will do five hits in seven seconds if you let her. And yes, when I made it here, I had found all the pieces for my fifth health pip. The total available is six. I had also maxed out the melee damage and dodge upgrades and had the greatsword, which is carried in the Dark Souls fashion over the shoulder with both wings on the hilt. Even so, I had to walk away from the game for a few minutes here to breathe and remind myself that it is just a matter of patient learning. Betty's attack patterns are incessantly aggressive, and dodging in the same direction as her role will not end well because the iframes do not last long enough. Betty's rampage terminated, we have enough soul energy to open death's door. Behind it, we hope, can be found the souls assigned to these two reapers, which will allow them to close their accounts and return to their immortal existence in the Hall of Doors. That isn't how it works, though. I love this depiction of death. He feels both familiar and novel, because we have seen those letters and heard that dissonant chord proclaiming our countless failures. Now though, we get to see what he looks like, hear the song that is meant to come after that chord, and learn the rest of his story. There is not a single spoken word in this game, and all dialogue is related through press A to continue text boxes, but the amount of characterization that is accomplished despite this is exemplified by death. He is presented as a moody teenager wearing a hoodie, whose shadow and attitude far outstretch his visible form. His lines read the same way. Death's message is one we might expect from a grumpy teenager. The system is broken. Us crows are trying to scavenge enough souls to keep the Hall of Doors infrastructure running, but this venture is destined for stagnation, especially if Death's door remains closed. Souls must die and pass into the ether in order for new life to take root from recycled soul energy. Hoarding souls in our vault at the behest of the Lord of Doors is actually preventing the creation of any new souls. It is he who locked Death inside his door to prevent his own time coming due, and the crows are stuck in the limbo of immortality with him. Except for the two crows whose assigned souls have departed, and who now have no choice but to take down the system, set everything straight, and make everyone as mortal as we are now. Death is a necessary part of life, and together we can make things right. Right, Mr. Grey Crow? The piano takes center stage here in a way it does not before or after this point. It is a more constantly audible companion on this journey than any other instrument, but here it presents what feels like an inward-looking soliloquy, 
to accompany this moment's introspection into what it means to be a crow. The entire story hinges on this fulcrum, the revelation of the real truth and the decision to follow it. Other instruments have taken the stage, pipes for the forest spirit, a gypsy fiddle tune for the witch, a sordid percussion for the frog king, playfully picked ukulele for Betty. In this fight, though, the story draws its limbs inward for its tightest pirouette. Likewise, the piano, the common thread holding this entire soundtrack together, is practically alone. It is a fight between two reapers, surrounded by white nothingness, and the only question being asked is what is a reaper anyway? Nothing else is present and nothing else matters. Just the one thing that makes everything else matter. Just the piano. The story unwinds its limbs, slowing its turn as it prepares to stick the landing. Returning to the Hall of Doors, we find the rest of the crows much more willing to right their wrongs and accept mortality. All that remains is to kill the guy whose refusal to die caused all this trouble in the first place. The impending boss fight is one of conclusion, bringing things to their natural and necessary ending. There are no more twists and turns, but it would be wrong to call this a victory lap. It is first of all too challenging for that, and it is more about finally knowing what must be done, and having the strength to do it. The sequence leading to the actual fight is the closest I came to straight up quitting this game, largely due to its length. I still only had 5 health pips to make it through all this time pressured grappling and bull door dodging, not to mention fighting the dude 3 times, all without a single checkpoint, but fortunately, I made it through to the actual fight. We fight the last lord in front of the soul vault in the hall of doors, and so we end where we began. I don't know why every game doesn't have their final boss fight in the hub and pulling mechanics from the rest of the game because it is fucking genius. You are standing atop the mountain that is what has happened so far, and it is all tying itself together. The Lord of Doors combines the three movesets he has just shown us with more bold doors and some other stuff like the laser which we haven't seen since the fight with the walking castle. He is even using Betty's signature roll which made me glad she taught me how to avoid it. I spent a good 45 minutes on this fight, which, you know, I mean, I think I actually spent over an hour just on Betty, and the Grey Crow was a bit tricky too, so these later bosses are really in a different league difficulty-wise. I beat the Frog King in one try, but if anyone did that to the Lord of Doors, I'll buy them a cookie. This fight is doable, you just need some patience. I'm gonna let the rest of my final attempt here play out so you can listen to his boss music. Okay. <laughs> 
Steadhound has been a faithful gravedigger, putting four of the bosses we killed to rest. In this shot, though, we can see the key the Lord of Doors dropped, which is the first step in initiating the post-game. We find ourselves amongst the other crows who have made a safe retreat to the camp of the Free Crows. I guess they are all Free Crows now. Returning to the Hall of Doors, we can pick up that key. It allows us to climb this bell tower and turn the world to night which, after a time, will cause Steadhone to open the crypt he's been standing in front of this whole time. Entering, we find him standing in what seems suspiciously like a boss arena. Sure enough, he is the last one who needs killing. He has been unable to die for quite some time now, despite having already dug his own grave. Now, after he has helped us put all the other unduly immortal beings into the ground, it is his turn to finally get some rest. The rest of the post game consists of exploring the far reaches of the map to uncover the remaining secrets just as I am seeking out the few remaining things to talk about. More than any other game I've played, Death's Door feels like it wants you to go around and find everything. All the collectibles, all the shrines, everything. First of all, the levels are all very tidy, compact, and intentful in their construction. Every space feels like it has value, so they all feel worth visiting, and this makes it relatively easy to seek out the relatively low quantity of hidden items. The true ending is also uncovered by exploring all the levels again at night after finishing the game, so you might as well find everything while you're at it. Most secrets are not too obtusely hidden, and if you have the stomach for Jefferson's 100% human-made soup, he will tell you about some of the secrets you haven't found yet. In addition, the door to an area will glow red if there is anything left to be found there. Jefferson is himself one of the secrets. At night, he can be found relaxing in his tank, and he will jump on your back and show you where the moon reveals some hidden paths in the flooded fortress. Again, I think they had some fun making this game. I did have to look up a couple things, the most glaring one being that you can apparently use these manhole things since literally the beginning of the game. I was expecting that to be an unlock or something, but I didn't even know there was a slam attack. I mean, there's no jump, so you have to fall off of something to do it. I feel like there could have been a character who said, gee, I wonder if these things could be used somehow to let me know I should try experimenting. But that's a pretty minor thing. Overall, the exploration feels like a part of the game that you should just be doing. There is not too much of it, and it does not conflict with anything else. And that is really how I feel about everything in this game. There is not too much of it, and it does not conflict with anything else. Combat, exploration, story, the upgrade systems. They are all so elegantly and reservedly tailored to fit the vision of what this game should be. Instead of leaning too heavily on any one element, everything has been kept simple and the developers remain secure in the knowledge that these simple components will create something greater than their sum. 
I would not say there is too much of anything. Acid Nerve have adhered to the message their own game sends, that life must not overstay its welcome. They have made their game small enough and simple enough that it can maintain a consistently high quality, not betray its own identity, and be packed full of nice little touches, like how you can cut these signs in half and read each half separately. I want more of Death's Door, but that just means it is avoided unhealthily overextending itself to the point of immortal banality. It is accepting of its own limitations, the most important one being that it, like everything else and even this video, must come to an end.